Hey, this is the Florida Sound Archive podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Kaiser, and we have a, another new episode here coming your way. Have a guest on here with me, Danny Morgan. Danny is a soundtrack to the Florida Islands, Sanibel, Captiva, places we probably all want to be right now. Danny Morgan, how are you, my friend? It's fine. Doing great. Good to hear. So uh, you're in your studio or at least a room that looks like a studio. Is that right? It is. It's a, it's where I practice and we have band rehearsals in here. At one time, we recorded some tracks in here that we would put on an eight track and we would take it to a big studio, dump them to a 24 and then build the whole song from there. Nice. We nice. Did a lot. We did a lot of Captiva Moon stuff that way. Here, here in my house on the eight, it was a Tascam 80 8. So that's the same machine that Steve Winwood used for Arc of a Diver. Okay. And it took three of us to get it down the stairs and into my van and over to John McLean's house. <laughs> that's how we did things. Nice. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah. And you've been doing this for a long time, right? So how many, we're talking like five decades now you've been, uh, your career has been going. Um, maybe a hair more than that. I started okay. in my first, uh, band at 10 and then, um, so it's been many, many years. Wow. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of fun. A lot of fun. It has to be if you're doing it that long. Yep, it's great. So 10, 10, at 10 years old, uh, what was your first instrument you picked up? Drums, and I was terrible. It's a great story. My father, uh, I was practicing, and my dad said to my mom, said, there's two things wrong with this. One, um, it's really loud. And two, he's terrible. <laughs> so at 13, my mom bought me a guitar. That was good. That was good for everybody. I, I bet. Did you have any early influences growing up that uh, you gravitated to when you were learning how to play the guitar? Um, Buddy Holly. The first song I learned on guitar, oddly enough, was a Ray Charles, uh, What I Say, that little lick that he played on Wurlitzer Piano. Um, that was my first lick I ever learned on guitar. And then I think Rave On by Buddy Holly. The Ventures were big. And it was fun to play all those venture songs. The ventures played more of like a instrumental surf style, right? Correct. So we would do some, I, I sang a few songs. Runaway, I think was the first song I sang as the lead singer of the band, the Del Shannon song. Oh yeah. And, and all I want to do is dream by the Everly brothers. Good picks. I, I'm a big fan of uh, Del Shannon's early stuff. So uh, very nice. Uh, how did you know you were a good singer? I didn't. <laughs> I don't know. I still I still don't know. You know, I throw it out there and let the let the people decide. But I did have a fabulous uh, high school um, music director and and he made us sing all this really hard stuff. In high school, I got a chance to sing with the Cincinnati Orchestra, Cincinnati Symphony Music Hall. They needed a couple tenors. And so it was uh, for the May Festival Chorus. Robert Shaw was the guest conductor. And um, I got a chance to sing the whole Handel's Messiah top to bottom with the orchestra, which was one of a. You know, we talk about the highlights of, tell me a couple of highlights of your career. That certainly was one. But in the process of learning all that, um, Robert Knopf was our high school music teacher. And he was just, he was also the uh, vocal coach for the Cincinnati Orchestra to get him ready for the May Festival Chorus. And he needed a couple tenors, so he grabbed a couple from our high school. <laughs> it was really fun. At that early age, were you traveling a lot were you going outside because that's where you originally were from right uh, like you were from kentucky but then you lived in cincinnati right yeah we cincinnati was not very far across the river and i did that's a good question because i did make friends i worked at a music store called dodd music and it was on madison avenue in covington kentucky and there were some cincinnati guys um who i met who were working there and they had a whole nother world going on in Cincinnati. So I became friends with these 
guys in high school. Um, and uh, one guy was named Sandy Nassen. And Nassen wound up uh, getting a record deal distributed by Atlantic Records. It was Herbie Mann signed him to Herbie's first label was uh, Primitive Man, distributed by Atlantic. And Sandy Nassen was the first guy to be signed to that label. And I met him when I was working at Dodd Music. Uh, and Jules Jacob owned this store, and it was a it was a jewelry store. And Jules kind of took it over from Uncle Eddie Jacob. And Eddie was like, what are you guys doing? And But he took in pawn stuff for guitars. And then we kept telling him, you got to get Fender. You got to get Gibson. You got to get Slingerland drums. And so every week, Jules, there'd be less jewelry cases in that store and more music stuff. And pretty soon it turned into Dodd Music. And it was a wildly successful music store. But in, to get back to the question yeah that's how i met a bunch of guys from cincinnati yeah and did you put out your first 45 seven inch record the o captiva sanibel sunset while you while you were still living in cincinnati is that right yeah i kept a home in cincinnati and i also in uh 84 85 I, I built a house here that was a band house you know like big pink you know the <laughs> the band the band you know, when they were in Woodstock and they had that yep. house. Um, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> I would build a band house. I don't know, you know, what are you going to do? I mean, it must have left a pretty big impression on you when you wrote pretty much a, a record, even though just two songs, about Captiva and Sanibel. So what was it about it that really just resonated with you? This is a, that's a great, you got great questions. But when I first came down, um, Sandy Nassen was the fellow I just mentioned had the had a gig at South Seas and uh, South on Captive Island and it was um, he it was playing in a really high end restaurant at South Seas called the King's Crown and uh, he and I both worked for Playboy um, Playboy nightclubs and he played music and I played music and and when in fact we were playing there at the same time. Um, and so we could do the kind of the corporate thing, you know, we, it was a coat and tie. You had to wear a white shirt. You couldn't wear a blue shirt. You couldn't wear a striped shirt. Um, it was a blue blazer, white shirt tie, and it was playing, you know, somewhere over the rainbow and when Sonny gets blue and stuff like that. Of course, I was throwing in some folk songs and some Beatles songs, but Nassen had to go cut that thing with Herbie Mann in New York. And he asked me to come down and cover it for a weekend. And I did the Woody Allen on him. I said, listen, I don't suntan, I stroke. You know, like Woody said in Annie Hall, when they're in the, he says, I don't suntan. And that was true. You know, I was a fair skinned, you know, light eyes, freckles, red hair. I was a candidate for bad things in the sun. And um, so, so uh, anyway, NASA wants me to come down there. And that's, I, I drove down from Cincinnati in this beat up van. I had this Chevy van that was just beat to death. And I-75 stopped at Tampa. So it was US-41 all the way down. And then when you got to Fort Myers, it was the road to get out to Sanibel. There was nothing. Then you crossed over the, the causeway, which had a drawbridge at the time, back in those days. And uh, you got over there, and there was nothing on Sanibel, hardly any lights. You got out going out to Captiva. It, I, I thought it was driving to the end of the world. I thought for sure Nassen and these guys would have a sign stuck in the sand. I get to the end of Captiva. There'd be no South Seas Resort. There'd be the sign that said, sucker. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I got there and and I the you checked in, it had a Quonset hut. They that's what they had as a as a reception area for this resort, because they were just building it. They were just, you know, acquiring land and building different uh, condos and everything. So <laughs> um, I got my little cabin. They had, you had cabins back then. It was really, really a lot of atmosphere. And I got up in the morning and I looked out the window and saw these palm trees. And I looked over this golf course they were building and he saw the Gulf of Mexico. And I went, ooh, wait a minute wait a minute, this is really, uh, I'm someplace really special. 
And um, it was, it was incredible. And I just met these fabulous people working at the restaurant and the people that came in there. Um, it was a fantastic experience. And, it, and I learned a lot about different kinds of music because in Cincinnati, greater Cincinnati area and, and in Kentucky, where I came from, uh, they were not playing uh, Jimmy Buffett. You know, I hadn't, I'd heard of Jimmy Buffett because I heard Come Monday when I was in California. But um, I really didn't know Bob Marley or any of the, Jimmy Cliff or any of that music. And um, I toured with the Beach Boys as an opening act. So I certainly knew their music, but um, the uh, all of that other stuff I didn't know. And these kids went to Jamaica like all the time. They, so they were they were into all that kind of great music, and that just kind of informed me uh, from then on to uh, listen to some of that and maybe create some. But a lot of it came from just being the soundtrack to my life. You know, I, windsurfing you know, running on the beach. I was a marathon, I trained for marathons. And so I do miles on the beach and all that kind of stuff. So those songs are like pretty much the, the lifestyle I, I grew into. So you were an athlete uh, one, and back then as well. Oh, that's a, <laughs> that's a, no, I mean, I, I was, I love to run, you know, and, and in our high school athletics was very, very prominent. So, um, uh, I wouldn't say I was a, a terrific athlete, but I, the running thing was pretty good. And I like the windsurfing and sailing and all that stuff. Yeah, it takes a lot of uh, <laughs> takes a lot of strength to do those things for sure. <laughs> well, it's it's fun though, and it's a good balance. All of that stuff's a great balance to being in a bar playing music all the time. And if you can keep healthy, you can do that stuff and maybe get to be as old as I am and still do it. <laughs> uh, how did you know you wanted to make a place like Sanibel, Captiva, just the Florida islands? How did you know you wanted to make that home and go away from where you were in the Midwest? Go back to Cincinnati in the winter. <laughs> it's an easy decision. <laughs> no, it just, it just worked out. I was, and in Colorado, I mean, Back in those days, in the mid '70s, well, early '70s, I started in Colorado before I ever came to uh, to Sanibel. But uh, the the there were great markets. You know, the ski resorts were great. The resort model was very good for me because you didn't you weren't doing a lot of one nighters. You're going in there for a month at a time, or you know, Colorado, we do a couple weeks in Vail, a couple weeks in Steamboat. We go out to Durango, we come back, we play. Maybe maybe you do one night in Boulder or one or two nights in Boulder at Tulagi, or you do um, a night at uh, a hotel maybe in Denver or something like that. But, but basically, the, the res and they always gave you lodging and food. And in Colorado, we got, I remember working for Vail Associates, we got free skis and boots and lessons and all that stuff. So it was a, a lot of fun. And then you get to Florida and it's somebody wants to take you sailing. And then you take a sailing course at South Seas, learn to sail with a offshore sailing, a famous sailing school. And you, you just get to do all that kind of fun stuff. I bet. And, and play music. Right. <laughs> what were the crowds like back then? Great. Why? There's no cell phones. There's no internet. And the live music was a big deal. It, it, it's a part of our, you know, it, it's a part of our culture, part of our sociology. And that's what's great about when I started playing music, like Paul Simon has his song, Born at the Right Time. He's right. You know, he's a couple years older than me. But uh, the, our generation for playing music, you, it doesn't get any better. We had great, great inspiration, the Beatles and <clears throat> everything from all the jazz and all the kind of stuff that was going on in the 60s. There were just tremendous things to, to inspire you. And then when you went out to play, there weren't a bunch of TVs in the places. There were no TVs, no TVs in the places. And then there were stages and lights on the, on the entertainers and 
So it became an important sociologically in our country. So born at the right. Thank you, Paul Simon. Born at the right. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of early comparisons did you get from people who would come check out one of your one of your gigs? I think that, that that's a very these are great questions. But this uh this one thing that I think kind of stuck with me, and I, I think it cap it really encapsulates the whole deal. John Denver goes to the beach. Because <laughs> I kind of had these kind of clean kind of songs and that kind of image. And um, and so, it, you know, it wasn't the ganja guy, but this kind of a different kind of guy going to the beach. more, in, And I had that kind of tenor voice. Um, so that was it. <laughs> that was the best comparison I got. <laughs> I can see that completely. And that was one of the first things that I kind of felt and heard was John Denver, but beachy. Yeah. yeah. That's what's great. Uh, <laughs> were you a fan of his as well? Oh yeah. Yeah. And I, when I played in Durango, this is in the early seventies, I got a chance to meet a lot of guys that wound up in his band. Um, they were playing in Durango. I had a really, good gig at a place called Four, Four Courts, but we all started in this bar down the street called the Gold Slipper, which was really a cowboy bar. I mean, a true cowboy bar. And so the the band, some of the guys that wound up in John Denver's band wound up playing at the Gold Slipper and they'd come down and see us playing at, uh, we were a country rock band back then called the Apple Butter Band. And um, so they'd come down and we'd hang out and John Summers and I became real good friends. And he wound up getting in John Denver's band as a banjo, fiddle, um, and guitar player. And he wrote a song on on an early John Denver album. Then he wrote a song called Thank God I'm a Country Boy. And that was on uh, Bringing It All Back Home, I believe was the name of the John Denver album. Or Back Home Again something like that. And um, yeah. and anyway, um, so through that, I got a chance to, because then he wound up in the band and I got a chance to go to John Denver concerts and meet John Denver. And, you know, he was always very nice to me. He's a very, very kind, nice person. And uh, I regret that we don't hear his music anymore. Sure. I, I agree. How important was that for you to meet someone that, you know, famous and had a really great career and they were nice, you know, because in many cases you meet that person that might be like one of your heroes and they turn out to be the complete opposite. So what was that like for you? Oh, it's, it's phenomenal. I mean, great. It just, you know, they're, they're encouraging and it, it makes you see that there are regular people out there. The Beach Boys were the same way. I cannot say enough about how kind and how informative the Beach Boys were to us. Just as helpful as they could possibly be. And boy, did we need help. <laughs> <laughs> what period of the Beach Boys career did you get a chance to uh, open up for them? Early 70s. Early 70s. And it was a short, short-lived thing because Warner Brothers wanted one of their acts that was on their label to do it. But it in that time, I certainly learned a lot. And I did get one day where I had a, a really tremendous uh, bunch of things that just lined up. I was invited to go. We were invited to go out there and, and see the Beach Boys at their studio. If, if you ever come out this way, and we were doing um, showcases in California. We did the Troubadour and the Ice House in Pasadena and and um, tried to get record companies to come see us and see if we could get a deal. And um, we went out to the, the Brothers Studios. We went out there one day and it was the first day Brian was back in the studio. And so uh, um, it was, they were getting ready to record a song and I was there and, and uh, Somebody didn't show up. I'll leave the details out, and because uh, there were some things going on. If you see the the movie uh, Love and Mercy, John Cusack played Brian. <clears throat> so it's the first day Brian's back, and Al Jardine says, "Danny can sing all those parts." So I got a chance to record with Brian all day. 
which was really good. Wow. Is that up there at one of your highlights? Yeah. Yeah. Again, you know, <laughs> I call it the, that was my definite right place at the right time. And that's the day that they also invited us to, to go open up. Wow. And a lot of the, I don't think on everyone, but you may know better than I would, but a lot of the musicians who played on some of those most famous records of the Beach Boys was the Wrecking Crew, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, Hal, Hal Blaine, which I met him when he worked with John Denver. And I got to know Hal Blaine a little bit. And what a great, again, sweetheart. You know, uh, when I did this one record um, in uh, Cincinnati, and we wound up getting Larry London to play drums. I was talking with Hal Blaine about flying him in from California to play drums on that record. But uh, he was, they're just sweethearts, there's all those guys. And they sit in with us. I mean, sat, we were playing in Fort Collins, Colorado, and John Denver was playing at the college at Fort Lewis. And, uh, and, <laughs> And they all come in to see us play. You know, of course, I think John Summers drug him in, the whole band. And then, uh, you know, Hal Blaine plays, to get, gets up and plays drums. And all those guys are sitting in. And it was just wonderful. And you get to talk to this guy. And they're all nice and all helpful. Just can't, I can't say enough about the nice people I've met. I bet. Did you have any moments during that early period when you were with some of these musicians and songwriters where you kind of pinched yourself and you were like, wow, I, I can't believe I'm, I'm here. Did you ever, did you have that moment back then? I think I had that moment now that I can't believe I'm sitting here on Sanibel talking to you and I've got gigs next week. Uh, but, but I think when you're in the moment, you're just thinking about whatever, we're, we're talking about whatever I'm talking about with them or what music you're doing. It's you're fully immersed in, in that. And for me, it's just mainly listening and trying to pay attention and figure what can I learn from this? You know, that's, that's the thing. It makes sense. And then, you know, cause the same with getting up there on the state on the big stage. I mean, say, are you nervous about that? Um, I, I was nervous when I was a school teacher right out of college and I'm in front of those the, the class of kids, you know. <laughs> Did you teach music in school? I taught fourth, fifth, and sixth grade right out of right out of college, briefly, until I got an offer to go on the road. Okay. What was yeah. that like? What, what was teaching like for you? It was great. You know, I, I taught inner city knife and gun club. So it was a challenge and <laughs> it was it was fine. It was good. And the kids are kids are kids. You know, they're great at that age. It, it, I guess that age before cell phones, before all that stuff. You know? Sure. In different times now. So uh, uh, so when you got on the road, what do you remember the first place that you went to? Um, let me think. That's a great question, too. I think it was Durango. I think Durango was the first place. And it was a fellow teacher that had a job teaching at Timberline uh, School out there in Durango. She taught French, Spanish, and I think maybe something else. And she's the one who said, you should come out here for the summer. This is when I didn't, I thought I would still be a teacher but she should come out in the summer and play in Durango. And she lined up this job at the gold slipper, the funky place. And um, so, and it had lodging and it had a meal a day. And so we said, what the heck, let's go out there and do that. And so we did it, but in the process, Vail Associates saw us and invited us to be the house band in Vail with the skis and boots and the lift ticket and the sign for any meal all day long, you know? <laughs> But, you know, we were real clean cut. We didn't drink. We didn't take drugs. We were athletic. We wanted to ski. We wanted to do all that. So um, those guys like Vail Associates thought they could invest in us. Sure. How did, the, how did these experiences of you playing these gigs and getting on the road 
being the house band, how did this help you when you were settled in Sanibel and you were starting a career there? Well, I think the main thing um, is South Seas Resort. It was called South Seas Plantation then. And because of my background playing for Vale Associates, playing for Playboy, there again, they were a corporation getting started. Um, they bought quite a few places around. They bought uh, Sundial and uh, they were in the process of, they think they bought the land or something for Cassie Bell and they were getting ready to build that. And the Mariner Corp, they were from Cleveland. And so uh, they just took care of us. And, you know, it, I felt welcomed there. And I felt like they really wanted me to be there. Um, and all kinds of people were surrounding us, you know, just really loving the fact that we were there. And and I wound up being, you know, I would be in this, I remember the first thing I did when I played for Sandy Ness and, and at the King's Crown, I went away that summer. A lot of those servers and bartenders were going up to Cape Cod. And so they called up Cape Cod, the place called the Lincoln Lodge. And um, they got me a summer gig there and got me a place to stay where they were where they were working. And so I went up for that. And then I got a call from the people at South Seas that they just bought Casabelle Resort and wanted me to come back and play at Casabelle and put a band together. And um, so I did that and just one thing led to another. But at the, that time in the early days, I was playing a lot in Sanibel and Captiva, but also continued to go back to Cincinnati area and play in Kentucky. Uh, we had a couple really good summers where we played on a on a barge that was parked on the Kentucky side and it overlooked the Cincinnati skyline. And those days were beautiful too, to doing that. But I would always come back to, to Sanibel. I don't blame you. <laughs> and, and Captiva. Right. And that's so now it would work mainly between those uh different things that Mariner owned. Although there were a couple one-offs that I played, I uh, played Tween Waters for a while in uh, a short while. And then I played uh, a few other places on Sanibel that would pop up. What was the scene like when you were there? What other bands, what other musicians were pretty prominent that you were aware of in the Southwest Florida area at that time? Um, when I first started playing at the King's Crown uh, solo, uh, there was the Captiva band with this guy named Michael Latona. And I think Marty Stokes might have played with him. I'm not sure. But the Captiva band was there. And I got to be friends with Michael. And through Michael, I didn't know much about anything in Fort Myers or Naples. Um, I wasn't meeting any of those people because I was working at practically every night. And if I had a night off, we just didn't like go across a bridge to hear anybody like we do now. Um, across the causeway so um, but through Michael which was an incredible guy to meet um, he knew he was from Miami and he knew all these guys over there um, that were great he and Jocko went to Jocko Pistorius went to high school together and the legend has it Michael was a bass player so Michael taught Jocko his first stuff of course Jocko surpassed anybody in the world you know he got a shot like a rocket but but Jocko also played with Peter Graves in the band that they had over in Miami that I think Joe Namath and some of the ball players it was called Brothers Three or Brothers Four Fort it might have been in Fort Lauderdale and uh and so Peter had a big band Peter was a trombone player and the, and he went on to be um be the contractor like when when uh, anybody who needed an orchestra would come in and play uh, Sunrise Music Theater over there, Peter would, like if Sinatra came in, he would have Peter conduct the orchestra. And Peter did a lot of that kind of stuff at Criteria. He wound up doing the Beach, uh, the Bee Gees stuff. Um, the first album that they did at Criteria, if I got this all right, before um, before Saturday Night Fever and all of that, um, they, he was involved in that. And then he went on the road with them as their band leader. 
um, but I got to meet Peter. And Latona and Peter Graves put together this thing in the early days when I was at, at uh, Santa Bell and Captiva called Jazz on the Green. And it started in a back room at South Seas and Lindbergh Hall was like a meeting room. And they did the first uh, jazz jazz co concert with the big band. And then Peter would bring in uh, different people, uh, jazz, jazz people that he knew to be the feature. Uh, Michael Franks was there one year, uh, Bobby Caldwell, um, all of these fabulous uh, people that and uh and Jocko and uh so I got to meet all those people and got to know that scene and then wound up getting a chance to record a criteria with Peter and that orchestra all of those guys not Jock Jocko <laughs> we had a, a meeting with Jocko with Stan Hertzman my manager and Peter and I and, and Jocko at a pizza place in Fort Lauderdale on US one I'll never forget it Jocko was great. And so we're sitting there and we're talking about um, us doing this recording. And I don't know if we gave Jocko a tape or what, but uh, he came to the meeting and he said, we were looking at the dates. He says, I have to go out to, to uh, Los Angeles. I'm going to do a Joni Mitchell album. And, uh, and so it turned out to be Hajira, which is in my humble estimation, maybe the best Jocko bass work ever. I liked it better than than Weather Report and all of that. I just thought that stuff he did with Joni was just uh, so melodically uh, mesmerizing. Just off the charts, beautiful. So uh, anyway, but I did, and then Jocko sat in with us at, at, when we were the house band at, um, at Chadwick's at, at uh, South Seas. He played only... We couldn't get him to play bass. He wanted to play my, I have a 12 string. I have this, uh, this is great. <clears throat> this is a, a, a 1961 Mose Wright 12 string. So Jocko loved this guitar and he just wanted to play this guitar. <laughs> crazy. That is crazy. Wow. <laughs> And he wanted to play drums. I think one song, one song at it when he sat in with us, we got him to play bass. But um, <laughs> it's great, great that, stuff. Yeah, that is really uh, those stories and those experiences are just uh, uh, amazing to hear. And uh, there's been a lot of stories of Jocko on the podcast from various guests. So uh, that could be my personal favorite so far <laughs> yeah he was he was a character and boy he would peter with that bit he he and peter and all those guys were friends they grew up they knew each other and uh and it was just great to be around that kind of and see how they play together man i mean michael brecker came in and played with that orchestra and all these different people um it was like magic and the arrangements, these guys would, different guys, Stan Webb, and I'm trying to think of the other guys that write these arrangements. And a lot of them were teachers at the school in Miami, the music school. And um, so they really, they knew their stuff, man. They were, that was really exciting. And that jazz band was pretty tight. The Miami, University of Miami jazz band, they put out some really great records. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of good, a lot of good people there. Sure. Uh, what was your experience like recording at Criteria? That was a little scary. I'll tell you the scary. I'll tell you a really scary moment. I was fine with Peter and those guys. And um, I had a couple of my people from Cincinnati that played. Um, so that was comforting. I brought uh, ba the bass player, uh, Cliff Mayhew. And Brenda Woodrum was her maiden name, Brenda F Woodrum Foles came down and uh, she sang on uh, other stuff for me. And then when I was in Cincinnati and I needed to get, you know, a great girl singer who could really figure out female singer who could, she, Brenda was great. And man, she, her voice was so beautiful on that stuff. And it's nice to have two old, two people from home, you know? Um, and then Hertzman was with me. So, and he and I were great friends. And um, so there's, you know, so we're in the midst of all these great people. One, the first night we recorded a criteria, 
we were going um, into the studio and Cat Stevens, I, I bought time at night. We bought time at night because you could get it starting at midnight. You could get good things. But you, I had Alex Sadkin engineering. He wound up being a big producer for, for Island Records and uh, all that. But these are the guys that were around. You know how everybody's, everybody comes up from somewhere. And um, so um, <clears throat> we're waiting to go in the studio. And I've got these guys out there, you know, and, and Hertzman says, you, you know, we're we're going to pay for these guys to sit in this lobby because Cat Stevens was in there and he wouldn't get out of the studio. He's eating watermelon and listening to a playback. And we're going, Jesus, Cat, get out of there. We need to get in. I got these guys and I got these guys in the lobby and we got to get them in there. That was the funniest thing. And, you know, I don't know how late we were getting in there, but yeah, you, you want to do your three hours or whatever these guys. So, so you're you're sending them home at least at three o'clock in the morning or three thirty. I can't remember when that ended, but God. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine going back to that now? <laughs> oh, man. And, I, and I'll tell you the other thing that really said so that wasn't scary. So the scary thing was I'm in there singing. You know, and one day, you know, I, this is before we went into the, we went into the big room and he had a full orchestra, French horns and everything for a couple of these songs. But the day, I think it's the day before that, I went in to sing um, my parts over the, they do a scratch track and then you go in and do a, a, a real vocal track. And so I'm in there in the booth, I mean, in the room, and I look up in the I look up in the control room through the glass, and Peter's in there, Hertzman's in there, and uh, all of a sudden, one B one BG comes in, another BG comes in, and I'm going, oh Jesus, you know, come on, I'm having a rough enough time being in the presence of all this stuff and all of you guys, and then they're there, some of the greatest singers watching you sing. It's like, oh God, help me! <laughs> so yeah, I, that was that was a nervous moment, that's for sure. <laughs> Did you ever have any conversations with anybody uh, that was very famous at a studio like that, where maybe somebody just said something to you that has stayed with you all these years? Just you know, uh, those guys were you know busy doing um, "Spirits Having Flown," this, the next album after that's what they were recording so they were busy they just came in you know who's over who's next door you know so that was one of those um you know i think just the, the people that you know like the beach boys you know just those guys when when i worked with them and we'd be eating at sam eating breakfast at sambo's you know what they, you know what they would tell me they tell me you don't want to do this you know you don't want a record deal I know you think you want a record deal, but trust me, you don't want a record deal. And then they break down all the, the what the money was, you know, and how, where it all goes. And, and then they said, unless you've written Help Me Rhonda, which it, to date, no offense, I don't think we hear a Help Me Rhonda in your catalog. Um, you know, unless you got those kind of songs, that's where their money came from, publishing. Because it costs so much to be out on the road, it was, you know, very very expensive, and they paid us well. They say, "Here's what we paid you. Here's what we paid the crew. Here's what the the trucks cost. Here's our manager gets this much, our agent gets this much, our publicity company gets a percentage." So it said, "What's we, the five of us that are partners in the Beach Boys have this much left." So. And it's it's not as it's not exactly what you think it is. Right, it's a machine. <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, it's what needs to be done to get right. The, get the job done. It makes. I selfishly need to ask you because I'm a big fan of his more than any other Beach Boy, uh, Dennis Wilson. Did you ever meet him? Yeah, I had breakfast with him. He was a. I mean, he was a nice guy. Very nice guy. Um, I didn't, that's about it, you know, and then we'd see him, he let Mickey use some of his drum stuff, which was great. We couldn't bring our stuff. We were in Colorado 
when we were in California, we got the invitation. We had to go back to Colorado and get some stuff and rent an airplane and all that to get to the gigs on the East Coast. So that was scary. Renting a, <laughs> a Cessna airplane. I called this friend of mine, Jim Wallerber, who was a flight instructor at, at, at uh, uh, it wasn't Fort Lewis College. I had the wrong college. Uh, it was uh, Colorado State in um, in Colorado in um, north of Denver. So um, Wallaber, I said, "Can you get off? We got this opportunity to tour the Beach Boys, but I got to get to Bangor, Maine." Was the first date, and we're in 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 in, in L.A. He says, "Meet me in Cortez, Colorado," and he rented a Cessna six seater overwing plane and met us there and it was a grass landing strip right grass so and we had we only had room for two you know how fender guitars are in the in the rectangle cases so we had for the bass we had we had the bass and my telecaster and mickey in the back we had to weigh everything we couldn't bring any cymbals we could take the shells of mickey's drums and a couple other things and I called Carl Wilson. He was so nice. I said, "We're gonna. May we borrow? Can we plug into your Fender amp? And can we uh, use your Wurlitzer electric piano? And and uh, can Mickey use some of Dennis's drum stuff?" And they said, "Absolutely." And they were there again. Who does that anymore? You know, a, a couple kids from Kentucky that didn't. You know, that were just raw i mean we were just you know naive kids but uh they were so kind that's wonderful to hear so that's so that's, so that's the lim limited conversations i have with dennis like just a couple more without jardine and more without pretty much did you know his album pacific ocean blue yeah did you, were you a fan of that record um, I didn't, I just knew that came later, right? Right. Came later. Yeah. Late seventies. Yeah. I got, I think I have it played it a couple of times and, uh, but yeah, I, I've listened to all that stuff and, yeah. but, you know, but I can't, it doesn't stick. I sure. to <laughs> uh, well, it was definitely a very, you know, beachy ocean surfer vibe to it. And it kind of reminds me of your first album that you that you put out uh which i have the uh, cassette here oh yeah <laughs> Beach Live. Oh, that's great. i'm sure i'm sure that's... that looks familiar to you <laughs> yeah that's great that's very funny <laughs> oh would you would you have thought in 2023 a european record label would be issuing a single for the swimmer <laughs> Surprise, or did you kind of uh, expect oh, that? <laughs> no, God, no. You know, for, first of all, for a lot of reasons. But um, that song is is an unusual song. You think it's a record company wanting to to do that and sign a deal and send you it? They actually sent me in advance. So I'm going like, and how did he know? So I asked. I wanted to see who was doing it. So I got a a, a, a zoom, not a zoom like we're doing on WhatsApp you know call so i could see him and very much like we're doing i could see where his where he lived and and this guy is so sharp rob butler and this be with records is a great record label they they're really good and they do really neat stuff so i said how have you been to santa bell or did you see me playing or something and he said no i said this one guy i work with um brought this to me i said does he ever did he ever see me he said no I said, so how in the heck did you find this? And he said, this guy said we ought to do this record. And I took a listen to it and I agreed. And um, so that would be the last. If you're going to license one of my songs and think you're going to make money on it, it probably would be Captiva Moon, you know, Saltwater Kisses. I don't know. There's a handful of them, you know, that probably would be more commercial uh, that you could make money. But um, The Swimmer. Who knows? It's a more uh, artsy fartsy kind of song. Um, I was listening to um, Adrian Ballou was also managed by by Stan Hertzman, 
So Baloo, when I wrote that, Baloo was doing some really cool stuff. And he was from Northern Kentucky. We all kind of grew up in the same area playing in in uh, bands. He had a band that called the Denims that did all this Beatles stuff. They were great. So before he became the twang bar king, as they call him, <laughs> um, uh, Baloo was, still, but he's done these really kind of neat melody things. And Joni Mitchell was doing some very beautiful stranger melodies and stuff. So I was listening to that and I, and the swimmer just kind of came out like that. And um, I took it to the band, my support band I was working with at the time. And, and we kind of kept goofing around. I had, I had a rhythm thing to it. And then all of a sudden, you know, those guys are David dust and start play all this kind of cool guitar stuff. And, and, um, and it wound up like that and it went over to John's house and recorded it. And, um, and then McLean played that uh, pan flute kind of thing on the keyboard. And John sang harmony with me and, um, and said, that's how that happened. But yeah, I had no idea. And it just surprised me. And I'm very happy. And I really like these guys. You know, I think that's a, I'm hooked up with a good group there. And, um, and now I have to figure out how to play it live. <laughs> <laughs> One of my personal favorite songs, too, off of uh, Beach Life is uh, The Swimmer. So uh, this term may not have been used back then, but it's thrown around a lot now. Yacht rock. Are you familiar with that term? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a serious radio station. Did you maybe not then, but now knowing it now, would you kind of put this tape in that genre of music on yacht rock radio yeah i think it could fall there without a doubt without a doubt it would it would be good um, I, think, I think it would be perfect <laughs> yeah thank you thank you <laughs> <laughs> you just can kind of picture yourself on a boat uh on the water and having that on and it just creates a mood for you uh i think the swimmer would be great if you were on a sailboat and you had the thing was flying down the the, the coast, you know, I think that would be a good one to have for, yeah. that, for that experience. <laughs> Did you include a lot of those songs in your gigs when that album came out? Yes. Yeah. We played just about all of them. And what the what was the was, reaction? What was the reaction that people had? Because, you know, especially when it's a lot of tourists, maybe, or even even locals, they may want to hear cover songs. And now you're throwing in these originals. So what was their reaction like to hear some of those originals? I think it's uh, if you set it up, you know, Livingston Taylor, by the way, is a friend of mine. And they talk about learning from someone. He's he's the master performer, the master performer. And um, so <laughs> it's uh, if you set it up, you know, then then you can you can sell it. You know, you have to relate it to some something they can relate to your audience. And uh, that's I just don't play them or this is a song I wrote, you know, you have to get it. You have to do a, a certain kind of setup to be able to sell it as if they've never heard it. But then some of them, thank God, knock on wood, um, have become sort of um, classics to all the visitors who come here. It is that that album has become in Captiva Moon. They've become part of their their uh, vacation. It's the soundtrack for them. So that's a uh, and there'll be certain songs. Um, somebody will, <laughs> one guy I know, is it like when I wrote Saltwater Kisses, he thought I was, I was watching him and some girl out in the, out, out, out in the water off of Tween Waters, and I said, no, I didn't see. <laughs> but it was like you know, so all these people have these experiences that go along with those lyrics, as I did when I was listening to Jimmy Buffett, you know. Man, I fell in love with that stuff living here. I you bet. Know, give me more. Give me more. Mm -hmm. And I still do. I still, you know, when I listen to Jimmy's records, I have everything he ever did. Um, he, first of all, he's a world-class writer, you know, as good as anybody ever. He's our Mark Twain, you know. And um, and so. <laughs> did you ever meet Jimmy Buffett? Oh, yeah. What was that like? Fabulous. Again really nice man he's very nice to me um he's invited me he's been on my stage and he's invited me up on his stage a couple times and um 
but he's just a great guy, you know, and gave me some good advice that I have a great story about Captiva Moon. So the second album after Beach Life did very well. Um, I think we sold about 120, 120,000 of those. Um, all included, you know, vinyl, uh, cassette and, and CDs. Of course, people don't buy records or buy, buy recordings anymore. They they don't even download it. Streaming's pretty much it. But um, Beach um, Life is pretty sought after on vinyl. So just as long as you know that. Yeah, the vinyl. Yeah. And I, luckily, I had vinyl to survive the, the, the hurricane, Hurricane Ian. Every, all, of my, all of my product went out my garage door in the oh. six feet in six feet of water along with a bunch of other stuff but um but the out my my vinyl survived because i had it in a safe place so it did not it wasn't subject to that so that's about all i have left right now i need to reorder if i'm going to have the other stuff but to get back to a uh, meeting jimmy um i went down to key west i'd sent some um copies of captiva moon down to his their office in 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 uh, Key West, and that's when their main office I think was pretty much on Duval Street, right off of Duval Street there, and uh, and I got a call from Jimmy's. I think it was Sun Sun Sunshine Smith called and said, Jimmy wants to meet with you uh, about Captiva Moon. Can you come down here and have dinner? And I said sure. So uh, Amy and I drove down. And um, went to he wanted to go to this little off the beaten path Italian restaurant off of Duval. You kind of go back to Slow Alley, and there's this little restaurant, real quiet, nice, unassuming restaurant. And we're sitting there eating. I'll just cut try to make it shorter. <laughs> and we're sitting there, and um, and he I he said I really like Captiva Moon. I have a copy in my plane, and and a, we got a copy in the office, and everybody likes it. But he leans over to me and he says, you're too old. <laughs> That's good. You know, I was in my 40, I think it was about 45 or something like that. And then he said, when we finish dinner, we'll go down to Margaritaville and I'll show you this band I signed to, to Margaritaville Records. So we go down there and there's this band playing. And I'm I'm up in the sound booth with Jimmy and we're watching this band and uh and he says, what do you think? I said, they're great, man. They're fabulous. He says, they're a really hot college band in the South. They're, they play all over the South. They're a hot college band. And he says, they sing in English, French, and Spanish fluently. What do you think? You want to do them? Or are we doing Danny Morgan? I said, where, where can I give you my money? <laughs> can I buy into this? And they were fabulous. But I get it. You know, I get that the idea of national labels and stuff like that, it's it's a it's a young young man's game. Did you like <laughs> having that control over your over your career in that way? Because a lot of stuff that you did was self produced and self released, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, but when I worked with Peter, you know, when when uh, it was kind of nice to have somebody with that kind of brain deciding how your song should be, you know. So I'm always open to whatever, you know. If you get good people. Well, what Rob, what uh, Rob Butler did with it be with records, you know, he wanted to do a B side that was a, like a dance groove. So the he, the the guy, I think, one of the guy who liked the swimmer to begin with, um, did a remix where they put stuff on top of the swimmer, the, the original recording, with this sort of incredible dance groove thing, and uh, and then. He had these seagulls like doing all this wild stuff in there, which was really unusual and more sound of the surf. He had, I didn't have any surf sound. I don't think on, on my record. You didn't know. And so he had all this surf stuff going on. So that becomes a whole nother market that I don't know anything about nothing. And so for all I know, that thing's going to go out there and become some, <laughs> you know, and, and so there's another, and that's good. I mean, that's good creativity. 
Right. But you had to lay down the foundation for it. And, and, and you absolutely did. Uh, thinking about your catalog and all the songs that you have written over the years, what's the one deep cut in your catalog that you wish more people would hear? Oh. Hmm. Golly, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, Tarpon Bay is nice, which is, uh, it's not a commercial song per se, but it's one on uh, this album, which oh, is yeah. It's Always Summer. Right. And uh, so I think, um, I think Love is for Everyone is one I recently, uh, in the last few years, wrote with Livingston Taylor, James Taylor's brother, who I mentioned is uh, the consummate performer of all performers. He's really great. And, uh, but that's one that I think has some legs. There's a video of that as well. There is on, on YouTube. Yeah. And uh, we're real proud of that. It's uh, that's good. I think that that works pretty good. Uh, and getting a chance to work with uh, Livingston Taylor in, you know, what was that experience like getting a chance to get to know him as well? <laughs> Fabulous. He's a great friend and wonderful guy. And, and, uh, we talk about everything. So he's, he's a really, I consider him one of my, one of my dear friends, but, um, uh, I just, again, you learn so much, you know, from someone like that. It, I can't even go into it. the stuff I've learned about, you know, vocal. I, I get a lot of great vocal coaching from, from Livingston <laughs> and, and just everything, you know, performing, Everything from, you know, I don't like the water bottle on next to your thing, you know, it, it, the, just all the details, the, every detail. He's got the whole thing. You know, this is better. You want to have water? Glass. But yeah, so we'll post a link to the video uh, in our description of our interview. So, uh, it's been great chatting with you. Let me just, you know, share that. I think it's been wonderful getting a chance to, to chat and learn more about your career and behind the music on so much of what you've done. And, uh, you're still going strong. You're still, you know, you just, you mentioned earlier, you're still playing shows and it, you said that's one of those moments where you kind of, you know, you pinch yourself and you're still doing it. So why do you think it's still resonating with people? And then, and the fact that you're able to go out there uh, all these years and still put on a show and keep the people coming. I think it's a lot of it's those songs have been with them. You know, a lot of times the songs um, have been part of their vacation. So that's what the tourists and then people who come here and they hear a song like Captiva Moon, and they've never seen me or never been to Captiva, but they hear that song and they go, wow, that's kind of cool. That's where I am. Da, 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 you know? So it's a uh, uh, right place at the right time. And, you know, my challenge, of course, as you get older, as all singers who get older, is to keep working on your voice and working on your, make sure you're keeping in shape, make sure you're not doing any dumb stuff. And, and um, and, and be able to perform because they're they're you know they're paying you and they they deserve a, a good performance and also i think um the cover songs i like to do cover and now i'll mention what I, why i like to do this oh this is i get to see a bunch of people my age out there that i've never met you know that are just out there and i'll say you know, I played this song in high school and we do when John when John McClain and I do Thursday night we do this um, kind of medley and, and I do a song Help by the Beatles. <clears throat> in high school, I could never figure out that George Harrison da 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 that guitar lick. So I get with McLean and I'm and I'm uh, saying, you know, I love that song Help. We ought to do that Thursday nights, you know, with Traders. And um so I get with McLean and like in 30 seconds, he's doing da 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 <laughs> I'm going like, bingo. So we do that and I'll tell a story, you know, that I've always wanted to do this. And now I'm finally playing with this guy. You know, here we go. Help by the Beatles. Bingo. And then you'll see. And a lot of young people like the Beatles. They'll be, it's, it, you talk about, you'll see these kids that are like teenagers or 20, or they're early 20s and they're Beatle freaks. They love it. So that's fun to do that. And I try to pick a nice cover repertoire that um, 
that is fun. And also we do um, American song, we do uh, autumn leaves and, and French and English. And, you know, we do a little Django in there and it's it, that we'd kind of go and, and John does, John does fabulous uh, Sinatra stuff. And then we play instrumental. Uh, we do a Les Paul song. We open up with How High the Moon and uh, that kind of thing that's interest. We try to be interesting and, and not real predictable. Well that's, <laughs> well, that's good, as I'm sure there are people who may come out to see you perform uh, regularly. And uh, what's been the, you know, one of your favorite personal moments that, that you that, that you can share that maybe so, so someone came up to you after a gig or even maybe even before a gig and uh, shared something with you that was uh, about your music and how it meant, you know, how it made them feel. I think it, um, being asked to play at somebody's dying bed was a pretty interesting thing. Sanibel Sunset meant so much to this guy that his kids had me come over and do that in the hospital. Um, th those kind of things are pretty strong. So yeah, I got on the water and and he uh, managed to. Um, hotel motel in Sanibel and was a big part of that scene and his kids um, became a big part of that scene as well and I was very honored and that's happened a, a few times so, oh wow in the weddings of course you know play this song at our wedding and when you walk down the aisle I want to hear this one you know so those are always great moments what's your most requested song at a wedding Oh, uh, um, probably Sanibel Sunset, something like that. I got to think about that. Okay. You think about that. A lot of the weddings now are going, you know, Jeff, they're going to young guys, you know, they, <laughs> they want these 23 year old guys playing their wedding. Sure. So, I but, uh, but I'm trying. So, so a question like that, I have to think back a couple of decades. Yeah, that's all right. Well, you think about all the songs that you probably have played over the years and especially is doing some of the covers. Uh, to have that song requested that was yours, you know, an original song, how'd that make you feel? Great. I mean, just, you know, that, that you made something useful, like anybody who does something useful. You know, you think about uh, the people in the medical field, the people in the, the education, you know, they, they do something that's useful to people. And that's good. You know, it's good to have, um, if you're going to create some, it's nice that it has some use. You know, it's it's not just you being, I don't know, something about you. Then it becomes not about you. It becomes about right. the gift, the gift of throwing it out there and, and see if somebody can get something from it. And that's, I think, that's the reason to do it. Yeah. You know, I, I a lot of um, songwriters, and God bless them, you know, because it helps them for sure. They write songs that are sort of therapeutic for them but um um and that's good because those songs also become songs for people who are having problems right i've just been pretty damn lucky to, to not have a lot of problems in my life that could be why you've had such a long career. I'm too. a happy guy. I'm That's happy. great. I'm you're thankful. Right. I'm happy. I pinch myself. <laughs> and you're in a happy. You're in a happy place too. As long as as long as the the hurricanes stay away, you're in a oh, great place. <laughs> I tell you, man, I'm, it's good. Not it's, the, talking to you and not talking about the hurricane today is great. Because I bet. live here. You know, everybody wants to come up and talk about that. How's your house? You know, and and then you say, How's your house? And, so all the conversations on breaks are all about that, which is needed. And that's, you know, that's part of what we do is we got to provide some happy music to the people that are coming here to work on their houses and right. they don't have a house left and, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's a terrible situation. What happened as I mean, you're there. So, but not to get into, in, into those weeds, uh, you know, I think one thing we haven't talked about, just your other side of your creativity is you also are an artist, right? I study painting in school. Yeah. I graduated with a 
my education was painting and education. So, uh, yeah, I, I've kind of come in and out of that in different uh, phases, depending on what's going on with it, how to balance it. But there's uh, been some years uh, recently in the last 10 years that I've had some terrific luck with uh, my painting as well. That a fabulous gallery in, in New York that carried my work and gave me some one man shows in Manhattan and all of that. So that's been good. Yeah. Okay. What are the again another side? It's abstract art, so it's yeah. it's it's not um, cognizant kind of work like writing songs. It's a whole you do you deal with a whole different part of yourself when you're doing that work. Uh, did you ever design any of your album art or anything that you've worked on? Yeah. I, I, yeah. yeah, I did all of it, all of them, every single one of them. So those are all things. in the old like beach life I had to do it's before I had I didn't have a computer or anything. It was all the old um, paste up stuff like they oh, yeah. we used to do it for ads, any ads and cut and paste and. I think the lines that are drawn around the pictures I did with a magic marker and I would always <laughs> do my own logos, you know, like, well, like that, like the, my, my signature. And I yeah. did, and then the paintings become, um, the paintings become lithographs. I'll do a limited, uh, like that with, without the, without the lettering on it, hard to see. But that, and then this is a, more of what a, the work I'm doing now. This abstract, this is right. This is the instrumental album, right? And so that's kind of the work I do these days. Very neat. And all of them are available and and signed in number prints. We're gonna put the links also in the description yeah. to uh, purchasing any of your any of your music. Although you won't find the tape, probably uh, you have to go. Yeah, you have to go hunt for that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, as we kind of round things out, uh, I wanted to ask us a few other quick quick questions here. Uh, but your answers might be uh, a bit a bit detailed. That's okay. Uh, so uh, you've done a lot of. Uh, road you know you've been on the road you know, over the course of your career is there that one road story that stands out to you as you know it was just for good or bad reasons it's memorable and it stuck with you um when the beach boys first came in to see us play and that's when they took a shining to us and invited us out to california that was pretty wild because the bartender I was in, I like to go in in the daytime and make sure the stage is set. I still do it. I do it at Traders. I'll go in at 10 o'clock in the morning or something and just make sure everything's ready to go for that night. So we can just walk in and play and not be fiddling with stuff. And and um, the bartender said, hey, we're in a hotel bar in Denver, right? So the bartender says, Beach Boys were, were in here last night. And I told them about you guys. It was a night off. And, and they said, they're going to come in tonight and see you play. I said, yeah, Elton John's Tendon Bar. And um, and so, <laughs> so they, uh, you know, I get up to play. Again, that was another thing that made me a little nervous um, because um, they're playing. I'm thinking that this lady, this nice, nice, wonderful bartender was just jagging me. She's jagging me, you know. And um, how could they be coming in this hotel bar to see us play? So anyway, we're we're there playing, you know, and if, from here to the wall, um, it, they line up and they're leaning against, I never will forget, it was a curved wall and it was carpeted and they were leaning against that wall and I'm going like, oh God, you know, I was so scared. But then they wound up sitting in and, you know, I had uh, Carl Wilson playing my my that twelve that twelve string. A lot of people want to play that twelve string. Sounds so, like it. <laughs> <laughs> they all want to play that twelve string. So anyway, um, it was a, a beautiful night. And then we wound up later that evening. Jardine had a song that he thought <clears throat> we could we could cut we could record. And so we stayed up to about three o'clock in the morning. And I had one of those GE, you know this little tape little cassette recorders you take to class with the with the buttons on the front and i had one of those and um because that's what i use for songwriting and 
uh, we stayed up and there was a spinet piano up in the uh, mezzanine of this hotel and, and Jardine and I and the bass player sat there and, and did this. Uh, he would play it for us and, and wanted us to learn it. And uh, so I recorded the whole thing. That was a pretty magical. Oh. I can imagine. <laughs> you, you also sent me a picture of you playing with Kevin Nealon from Saturday Night Live. Uh, I'm a huge fan of that period of SNL. So how did that happen? Um, it, it was year, years before that. Um, Hope Hospice was doing a benefit and I was called to, to play. So I played one year. They called me again to play the second year. And then um, it was a walk and it was from the mucky duck on Captiva up, up and back. And the second year, um, Kevin Neal's mom and dad lived on Captiva. And so I got a call that Kevin Neal was going to play or wanted to play. And I said, so we talked on the phone. He told me he played five string banjo. I said, great, come over to the house. You know, let's run through some songs and then we can do the, we'll back you up or You'll jump in with us and we'll do some some of that stuff. Like uh, we did a Beatles song. Um, I've just seen a face. I can't forget the time or place. Bing, bing, did it, ding, 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 ding. You know, it's really fun. And so we we hit it off. And so when he comes into town, he'll uh, usually come over with his family. Because, I again, I, my music's part of his family before I knew him. His mom and dad were fans of mine. And and brothers and sisters knew me. And so, so that's how that happened. So it's always fun. I got a really neat tape of us recording at his mom's on her porch. Oh, wow. That, I mean, when we were not record, we were practicing, we were learning songs and she decided she'd do a phone, phone film of it. <laughs> we're looking, it's like Saturday morning. We, she's got coffee out there for us. We're looking pretty, pretty funky, you know, but, <laughs> No, he's great. He's great. He's a wonderful man. Again, nicest guy on the planet. Very kind, very thoughtful, you know. He's That's great. Great. great to hear. Great to hear that too, because I'm a fan of his. So it's nice to know he's a he's a nice person. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Uh, good deal. Uh out of all the places that you've played not just in Sanibel in that area, but just in, you know anywhere in Florida in general. Uh, do you have a favorite place that you've played in Florida? A favorite venue, uh, club, lounge? Well, I think, yeah, I mean the South Seas, the Chadwick's thing was unbelievable because I had a budget for a band, a, a full band, and we and I did the stage. You know, it was just perfect. I put up all these backlights. I did all the design. I put up palm trees. I had birds. You know, I designed the whole stage and and uh, when our gal singers would do a song, I had a, a light that would come down and I did all the lights with my feet, you know, because we didn't have sound guys or light guys. But we had a EAWs, these great speakers and just magnificent sound. And. Um, and it, we had, it sounded great. It sounded great to us. We could hear. When it was before any of the in-ear monitors and stuff, we had floor monitors, but it was a perfect room and sounded good in there and people danced and families came and the kids could dance on the floor and, you know, just all of this stuff. It was like the best situation that I can remember. I can't imagine. And it way better than being on a big stage and, and being in the big time. Way, way, way better. It's so intimate and you could just hear everything and and the music we did we had a, all the bands that, you know because a lot of my players would come and go depending on how their lives were going but the bands were always great the guys that played in my band were just and girls were absolutely spectacular spectacular i mean i get these young people out of the university said the 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 um the conservatory cincinnati conservatory and uh, boy, they were just smart, smart, <laughs> great kid. And they, they, they'd like all the drum things. I would just hum things and they'd be writing it out. They'd write out all, I have a whole book of the drum parts from my records. That's one of those kids did. Wow. So, you know, they just scored everything. 
they could do it. They're so smart. They could do it when the damn thing's going by. They could just go like that. <laughs> it's like, get out of town. Right. So that was a great thing. And, and the place was great. And the owner, the guy, the guy who developed the resort actually paid for, helped pay for one of my recordings. He just said, to this day, he's a humongous fan. So, that's great. That's great. <clears throat> so that it's nice to have that kind of, you know, from the top down, you know, the top down. It was really a great time. Yeah, but I can imagine. Funny, funny stuff, man. Funny. <laughs> um, uh, the difference, you know, Henry Winkler would come in there, and and um, all these different guys. You know, it's just. And and I remember the guys from Jensen Resorts driving a damn golf cart in the front door to the dance floor. That kind of stuff. Just like people would, you know. <laughs> it was it was wild. It was good. Speaking of being on stage, what was your most awkward stage moment you can share? Oh golly. Last week when I forgot the words to Second verse to Captiva Moon. No, I don't. I don't know. Uh, yeah. How does that happen? <laughs> oh, yeah. I get distracted. McLean says you. If somebody <laughs> walks in the door that you know, and they're waving at you and stuff, and we're in the middle of the damn song, and you know, <laughs> you lose where we are. <laughs> and that is exactly what happens. These people talk to me, or they'll come up while I'm singing and want to, "Hey, how's your house?" <laughs> I mean, you know, God bless them, but. Yeah, I am trying to sing. You're right. You're trying to. You're right. You're right. That's but, they're, but they're but they're lovely. Everybody, I'm so happy. I have anybody who wants to hear it. So very, very, very thankful. Well, as we kind of close things out, uh, I want to kind of turn it over to you to kind of close out the interview. Uh, any last words you want to share to? Uh, fans, supporters of yours. Uh, just in closing, I will turn it over to you, Danny. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can't tell you how, how much um, I appreciate the many, many, many years of uh, being able to, to play for people, play for you guys <laughs> and make some music, record some music that you like. <laughs> 